So before the break, I talked about the theory of international cooperation to provide a global public good like greenhouse gas emission reduction. What I'm going to do now is what actually happened during the international negotiations and thus do our predictions that these things will fall apart and actually hold water. And then I'm going to contrast this at the end with acid rain and ozone for reasons that I'll make clear. So what happened during international negotiations about greenhouse gas emission reduction? I think the summary is here. There's a long history of good intentions, but there's not so much of a history of success. Climate change is driven by greenhouse gas emissions, and particularly carbon dioxide, and has been on the scientific agenda since the paper of Arrhenius published in 1896. But that for a very long time, this was sort of an esoteric thing that was in textbooks and sort of discussed as a curiosity that nobody was really paying attention, essentially because the measurement systems were not in place to actually back up this fear. Because Armenia said, yeah, the world will warm if we do this, and we're doing this, but there was no way of saying, telling whether he was correct or not. That changed in the early uh, 1980s, where indeed two things were well established. One, that CO2 concentrations were indeed rising, and second, that the world was indeed warming. So that happened in the early 1980s, and sort of this obscure field of climatology became less obscure. And politicians actually very quickly set up the sort of the first sort of serious engagement between the academics and politicians took place in 1985 in Filov and 1986 in Bellagio. And it sort of became a big thing in 1988 in the North Conference and then it was very well established when the second UN conference on environment and development took place in Rio in 1992. The first one was in 1972 in Stockholm and then 20 years later people came together uh, in Rio to talk about everything that had to do with environment and development. In Rio five or six international environmental treaties were negotiated I said five or six, that means that four or five have been forgotten, basically. But one uh, remains, and that is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. As I said, negotiated in 1992, ratified within a few years by basically all countries. The, as the name suggests, the Framework Convention on Climate Change is a framework convention. It actually doesn't do a lot. The real thing that it does, the thing that it promises is that it sets the rules as well as the frequency of negotiations about climate policy. That is essentially what the UNFCCC does. It sets the ground rules for later talks. Two exceptions to this. One is that the UNFCCC acknowledges common but differentiated responsibilities of countries, which is climate speak for saying it's the US and uh, Europe that did it, so they should take the lead in solving it. On the one hand, it acknowledges that climate change is a common problem of humankind, that is the common responsibility, and because it's a common problem, we are all responsible for solving it, but at the same time, it's clear that some contributed more to causing this problem than the others, and therefore they should take the lead in solving it. This was an unfortunate insertion in the UNFCCC, it essentially means, or it essentially gave license to endless bickering. And every time somebody said, oh, but you should also be doing something about your emissions, China or India or Nigeria, then immediately the reply comes, common differentiated responsibilities. You did it, you go first. And it is true that past emissions are dominated by emissions from the rich countries. And yes, the historical responsibility is there. But at the same time, the bulk of future emissions will come from countries like China and India, and Brazil and Russia and, and Nigeria and South Africa. And that means the actual levers to control this problem are outside the historically rich country. And this sort of leads to a fairly confrontational and not necessarily uh, constructive discussion. The second thing that the UNFCCC establishes, and we talked about this, is in its Article 2, and that is that we should in the long term achieve stabilization so as to avoid dangerous and protecting interference. Right? And we talked about the exact meaning of these clauses uh, before. 
So those are the two things that the UNFCCC establishes, common but differentiated responsibilities and stabilization. And then it says, and now go talk about these things. And talking is what they've done. Uh, what you're looking at here is since the UNFCCC entered into force in 1995, so that is when a specific number of countries have uh, ratified it, uh, until December last year, in blue, the number of meetings that have been organized. And the UNFCCC calls for one major negotiation session every year. It's typically held in late November, early December. But then they realized that actually there was a lot of the agenda, so they introduced semi-annual meetings, that they were meet six months earlier to sort of do pre-negotiations, and then they discovered, well, perhaps this is not enough. And now they're meeting every quarter in a negotiating round. And then they also set up all sort of subsidiary committees for this and a subsidiary committee for that and so on and so forth who also have their meetings. And by now, the number of meetings per year under uh, the UNFCCC runs into the 140 is per year. That is two or three meetings every week to talk about international climate policy. And the costs of this, and this is just the cost of flying to the meetings uh, and uh, the labor costs of attending the meetings, run into uh, 100 million or more dollars per year. So this is a very substantial investment of money. About 1.4 billion has been invested uh, over this period. About 13 and a half thousand person years have been spent in these meetings uh, alone. And then you can rightfully ask, so what did they do during those 13 and a half thousand years of talking? And that is uh, the next. The first meeting was in Berlin in 1995, and there was almost an agreement on how much emissions should be reduced. Almost. Typically when this happens, when there's almost a success and then a deception, they take a year pause and then they come back again. And in 1997, there was an agreement in Kyoto. So this is the third round of negotiations. And the Kyoto Protocol specifies two things. One, how much each country should reduce their emissions by. For the vast majority of countries, the answer was zero. But for countries in the OECD, roughly, so that's the US, Canada, European countries, and Japan all agreed on emission reduction targets. And the Kyoto Protocol also allowed international flexibility mechanisms. It essentially says if a particular country does not want to meet its targets domestically, it can give money to another country to reduce their emissions by more. So Kyoto settled uh, all that. But Kyoto did not settle the other, perhaps crucial, questions. A, it set emission reduction targets, but it did not agree on the definition of emissions. It said, yeah, you can convince other countries to reduce their emissions on your behalf, but it did not say whether there were any sort of limits to that, to the extent to which you could do this. Could you offset 100% of your emission reduction obligations in another country? Kyoto was silent on that. It did say there is a limit to this, but it did not specify what that limit was. And Kyoto also does not specify, so you have a target for undefined emissions and a certain fraction of which you need to do in your home country, but an undefined fraction. What happens if you don't do this? So there were no sanctions agreed on what happens if you miss your targets. So a year later, Countries met again in The Hague, and The Hague was interesting for two reasons. Uh, one, it was the, the last time, the last negotiations of the Clinton-Gore administration. And the second, it was the last round of the old Europeans. So what happened in The Hague, Al Gore was sitting there, Al Gore was negotiating on behalf of the United States. He was sort of wanting to make climate policy, international climate policy, a strong plank of his bid for the presidency. So he was sitting there waiting to do a deal with the Europeans, but the Europeans couldn't agree. And if you read sort of later accounts of what happened, then the Germans and the French say it was the English who did it, who did not want to agree. And the, if you ask the English, they said, no, 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 it was the Germans who didn't want to make a deal. And it's a bit unclear who was really to blame. But what 
did happen was that the European countries did not have a common position. And because the, the French were fighting with the Germans and fighting with the, with the English, essentially, Al Gore was sitting there waiting. And there was nobody to talk to because they were fighting amongst each other. What happened as a result of the Hague is that Europe has essentially withdrawn from the international negotiations. Essentially, since 1998, uh, the European position is pre-negotiated, and because Europe is a democratic country, <laughs> it is also publicly known. So since the Hague, there is no point in talking to the Europeans anymore, because you know what they're going to say. You can just look it up on the web, this is the European position before the coming negotiations. So essentially, Europe has withdrawn from the real negotiations. And then, of course, uh, Al Gore did not win the election, although some say he did, but he did not become the next president, that much is sure. The next, the Bush-Cheney administrations were quite a bit less well deposed to international climate policy than uh, the previous Clinton Gore administration. So things changed a bit, meant that Europe had to reconsider. It was no longer dealing with a friendly U.S. administration, but with a less friendly or perhaps an unfriendly one. And then in 1999, uh, they met again, this time uh, in Marrakesh, uh, it's in Morocco, and they reached an agreement on the three missing pieces of Kyoto measurement of sinks, how to define emissions. And there, a good bit was given in to uh, the people who were not so keen on emission reduction by saying all sorts of everything counts as a negative emission. They gave a lot of leeway on how to use international instruments, international flexibility instruments. Is there a question? Yeah. Uh, this time in, in Marrakesh, is, is the EU um, included in the negotiations? Yeah, yeah, they were there. They're just, <laughs> they're, se they're not negotiating in the sense that they could surprise their negotiating partners. They just had, this is our position. Which is? You can look it up on the web what our position is. <laughs> so it's, I mean, normally what you do in negotiations is that you hold something back so that if you make a move, I can make a move, and then we reach agreement. That's how negotiations work. You start here, then you move a little bit, and I move a little bit, and you move a little bit, and I move a little bit, until you meet in the middle, right? Europe cannot move. You can move, because you're free. <laughs> but Europe cannot move. The only thing that can happen is that other countries agree with Europe's predefined position. So that is what I mean with they essentially withdrawn from the negotiations. They're there, but they're completely and utterly predictable. There's no surprises. This is what the Europeans are going to say. So, in Marrakesh, they agreed on the definition of emissions, they agreed on to what extent international uh, instruments could be used, and they also agreed on what would happen if the targets were missed. And essentially what, they, what the Kyoto Protocol says, that if you miss your target next time round, you have to do 30% more of what you otherwise would have done. But at that point, what you otherwise would do is undefined. What happens if you don't do 30% more? So you don't you do 30% more of something that is undefined. You just redefine what you would have done otherwise. <laughs> so there's no sanction. There's no sanction. And then, to top it all up, emission reduction targets for a number of countries were relaxed. Marrakesh seemed like a strong agreement, an international agreement on how much to reduce emissions. By the time uh, we're in Marrakesh, uh, it is actually substantially watered down, the US is not playing, and then later on a few other countries, Canada, Australia, sort of been dropping in and out, there's also no sanctions for saying we're not going to play by the rules no more. The Kyoto Protocol entered into force after very su substantial pressure from both the US and the EU on Russia, uh, and in the end the EU won this and the Kyoto Protocol entered into force in 2005. The Kyoto Protocol says targets for the years 2008-2012, so this is in the past by now, and those targets have now of course become obsolete. There's no sunset clause in the Kyoto Protocol, so the targets are now just historical curiosities, but the other parts of the Kyoto Protocol, and America of course, and particularly the international flexibility mechanisms, they remain. They are just part of international law by now. Now the Kyoto targets expired at the end of 2012, and a lot of negotiations have been about the successor treaty to Kyoto. That process started in Bali in 2007 when people solemnly pledged 
to reach agreement on a new climate deal by 2009. So that was a bit of preparation, right? So you hope that the target's going to expire by 2012. So we want to know what would happen in 2013, and it would be good if we would know that five years in advance so that we can plan, right? That was essentially the idea. And this should have happened in Copenhagen. And for those of you who were paying attention then, the hopes for Copenhagen were enormously high. There was a lot of media attention. There was about 40,000 people traveling to Copenhagen. It was a big mess because Copenhagen is not a very big city. So you really can't deal with 40,000 visitors. It's a big mess. Uh, lots of people there and everybody was expecting, yes, we're going to finally clinch the deal. And a lot of governments really seem to think this. There's a lot of leaders of government there. Brown was there, Tony Brown, and then Prime Minister uh, Sarkozy, the then pre President of France was there, Merkel was there as the Chancellor of Germany, Obama was there as the President of the United States, Chinese sent the Vice President, uh, and so on and so forth. And that sort of indicates that people were really expecting to clinch a deal, because I mean, Obama doesn't travel to a meeting that he knows is going to fail. That would be bad for your political reputation. So, the unfortunate result of Copenhagen was that despite the enormous effort and the enormous pressure of basically everybody in civil society, that they could not reach a deal. They could not agree on how much each country should reduce their emissions. And in the end, after two weeks of fairly furious negotiations, the whole deal essentially collapsed. At a certain point, Obama was so sick of the negotiations that he took what he fought with uh, four other important countries uh, aside, and that was South Africa, Brazil, Russia, and China. <laughs> Obama just walked off with them. And then, of course, the rest of the world got furious, right? The Nigerians were furious because South Africa was picked as a representative of Africa. The Europeans were furious because they were no longer considered to be players on the world stage anymore, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, <laughs> the whole thing just collapsed. It just literally uh, collapsed. If you were paying attention at that time, you would recognize this as a furious response. A year later, countries met again in Cancun, and the only thing that they could agree on was to try again. Ditto in Durban, ditto in Doha, and so on and so forth. The agreement was let's keep talking and we'll now reach agreement not by the time that deal expired but later we will reach an agreement in 2015 and then with da 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 all the delays that come into play essentially there was a five ten year lack of emission reduction targets planned in by now a number of negotiating teams particularly the US and UK teams began to realize that there is a structural problem here, that there is a reason why countries can't agree on how to provide a global public good. And the tone of the negotiations changed in 2014 in Lima. And what we uh, saw there was the introduction of an ugly mouthful, the INDCs, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions. There's two operative words here. Intended means this is not a legally binding target. This is an aspiration. This is what I hope to achieve. This is not what I promise to achieve. This is what I hope to achieve. And the second operative part of the INDCs is nationally determined. These contributions to climate policy, to greenhouse gas emission reduction, are not set by international negotiators, they are set in democratic countries by parliament and in other countries by whatever is a legitimate way of policy making. So what about the EU? The EU is a nation in UNFCCC terms, so it's the EU that nationally determines what the EU targets are. It's not the United Nations that set this, it's the EU that sets these targets for the EU. It's the U.S. who sets these targets for the U.S. It's China who sets these targets for China. Now, this is technically known as plans and review. So the plans is that every year or so we come together and everybody goes round the table and says, I promise to do this next, this next year. 
and then you review and say, well, if we all keep our promises, do we do enough? And last year you promised to do so and so, but you didn't. Are you going to step up to the plate this year? That is plans and review. If, if, if say, for instance, uh, the UK were to leave Europe, uh, would that mean that they would obviously face completely different like, uh, settings or, or on, in terms of the UN uh, The EU is a partner to the UN C, but the UK is as well. That creates problems elsewhere, but it is not the case that the UK would automatically drop out of the UNFCCC if it leaves the EU. At the moment, it's sort of twice in, and then it would be once in. Who is the captain for the 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 UN, or rather the Kyoto Protocol, has a cap and trade system between what it's called Annex A countries. NXB country, sorry. That instrument is there on paper, but it's never used. The emissions trade that is currently going on in the UK is an EU regulation. And should the UK leave the EU, it is unclear whether it would also leave the EU ETS, because Norway is part of the EU ETS, but Switzerland is not. And it's unclear whether the UK would be more like Norway or more like Switzerland or more like Peru yeah. <laughs> or Canada. So don't ask me those questions because I don't know the answer. Right? And I don't think anybody knows the answer. What we see, saw in Lima was essentially the first steps towards abandoning what had been tried in Berlin and Kyoto and in Copenhagen to come up with internationally agreed legally binding targets. That has essentially been abandoned, or the abandonment was foreshadowed in Lima, and it is being replaced, was being replaced by a plans and review system. And plans and review has sort of practical advantages. It also has a theoretical advantage. If you are in international negotiations and you are rational, but you don't know the future for certain, what are you going to promise? The best way to enter a contract is to under-promise and over-achieve. Because if you under-promise and over-achieve, then you are rewarded because you are virtuous later. If you over-promise and under-achieve, then of course you're the bad boy or the bad girl. So your rational position if you're negotiating about something uncertain is to under-promise and over-achieve. If you are not necessarily held to your promises, if your promises are seen as intentions rather than as things you have to meet, you can be much more honest. So internationally binding targets, you don't want to be too enthusiastic. Plans and review, you can be more enthusiastic. So that is one reason, theoretical reason, why plans and review is preferred for this type of negotiations. And there's also a practical reason, a pragmatic reason. Climate change or greenhouse gas emission reduction is not the first public good, global public good that we provide? How do we provide other global public goods? What happens if we need the United Nations peacekeeping force? Essentially, we go around with a begging bowl. We organize a big jamboree and say there's a big conflict in Libya. How do we prevent a lot of bloodshed? We go around with a begging bowl. And the begging bowl typically is filled with German and Japanese money and soldiers from Nigeria and Pakistan. That's the pledges that you would get. And that is how we provide international peacekeeping service. If there's a big outbreak of a disease, say a Zika virus, what do we do? We organize a big international jamboree and we go around with a begging bowl and say, who has nurses to spare, who has doctors to spare, who can develop vaccines, who can develop medicine, who can provide money? And that is how we meet this particular demand for a global public good. And it's always imperfect. You never get quite what you need, you never get quite as much as you need, but you're getting things. That is how we provide global public goods, by going around to the begging bowl, by making pledges, we're going to solve this problem, and then uh, six months later we come back and say, did we provide enough, did we need to work harder, or did we solve the problem? That is how we do things. And in Lima, sort of the suggestion came, we should try this for climate policy as well. And this was essentially confirmed last December in Paris. If you read carefully through the, Paris, the text of the Paris Agreement, then essentially it puts countries under an obligation to do whatever they want to do. That is what the Paris Agreement says. Every country has to formulate a climate plan. 
but it's up to the country to say what should in, be in that climate plan. There is a notional deal there that in successive rounds the plan should become more ambitious, but it's unclear how ambition would be defined or measured. So essentially what you say, you have to make a plan, Robert, and in two weeks' time the plan has to become better. That's what it says, but not more than that. And there's no sanctions if the plan does not increase in ambition. There's no sanctions if you want to leave the Paris Agreement. So that is essentially what happened in Paris. What made the headlines was that at the same time they made the long-term targets more stringent, whereas previously it was agreed that the world should not warm by more than two degrees relative to pre-industrial. Now it says should not warm more than two degrees, but if at all possible, we should keep it below one and a half. But that is a completely empty promise because there's no mechanism whatsoever to deliver on this promise. So I interpret this as a sop to the environmentalists. This is what really happened. We said climate policy means that every country does whatever it thinks it should do. And then this was a way to placate those who favor strength in climate policy. Because of this, because there is no longer an international agreement on what countries should do, developing countries lost their leverage. Previously, up to Copenhagen, say, everybody, every country on the planet had to agree on everybody else's emission reduction targets. So a country like Peru, or a country like Ghana, or a country like St. Lucia could say, we don't agree with Europe's promises. We think that Europe should do more. And because the United Nations works on the principle of uh, consensus, universal agreement, to um, whatever the treaty is, the response of Japan, USA, EU was, we don't want St. Lucia to say this, we don't want Peru to say these things, so we're going to give them money so that they agree to our targets. And what we've seen from Berlin to Copenhagen is that every negotiating round, the amount of money on the table for developing countries increased. Not in Paris. In Paris, what happened was that the old promises were repeated, but there was no new money put on the table for developing countries. Because since they had no longer a say in what the targets were. They essentially were disqualified from the negotiations. This process, we started in Berlin 1995. Uh, this process took 21 years. Essentially, before the break, I said, well, game theory tells us that it will be extremely hard to negotiate an international treaty that provides this global public good for greenhouse gas emission reduction. He said, simply won't work. Those predictions were made in the early 90s, before this whole process started. So on the one hand, we should feel good about ourselves, right? As a profession, we made a prediction, you can't do this. And after 20 years of trying, trying very hard, international negotiators have now said, yeah, you were right, and you can't do this. Of course, as science communicators, we should feel bad about ourselves, right? Because we had these robust predictions in the early 1990s and nobody listened to us. Of course, as taxpayers, we should also be perhaps worried that so much money was spent on something that we knew wouldn't work. But academically, we made the correct predictions. And we've now switched to what I think is best uh, interpreted as a flats and review system. So, so much about climate policy. You can wonder, of course, like, what about I said rain? Don't we have a European treaty that says that we can no longer uh, emit acidifying substances? Yes, we do. That was successfully negotiated by the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. And don't we have an international treaty that says we can no longer emit substances that destroy the ozone layer? Yes, we do. That's the Montreal Protocol. And that was negotiated internationally as well. Do these things not contradict whatever I just said? Was there a possibility that perhaps for climate we could also have negotiated an internationally binding treaty? I think the answer to that question is no, and I have 20 minutes, 17 minutes, to tell you uh, why.
So let's start with acidification. Now, for the Europeans in the room, this is ancient past. Acidification was a big problem in the 80s and in the 90s, but it's gone from Europe. It's gone from North America. We've solved it. Acidification is still a big problem in East Asia and in South Asia, and it's an increasingly common problem in Latin America and in Africa. But in the rich parts of the world, it's basically solved. And what was done in Europe was essentially uh, an agreement. First, there was an agreement, it's the Sofia Protocol, if I'm not mistaken, among Western European countries to cut emissions uh, by 30%. And then a few years later, there was a deal between all European countries, including the former East, to reduce emissions uh, more strongly. And these are legally binding targets. This was, uh, as I said, a treaty that was negotiated outside the European Union. This was a treaty negotiated on the auspices of the United Nations through its uh, Economic Commission for Europe. That means that also countries like the US and Canada were around the table. And actually in these negotiations, because a lot of this was started while the Berlin Wall was still standing, before the expansion of the EU to the east, the EU actually had nothing, almost nothing to do with this. This was all European countries there, sovereign entities negotiating this, and they succeeded. Across Europe, the deposition of acidifying substances, and that is why you guys need to talk to your parents uh, to find out what is acid rain, right? That's not something that modern uh, or the current youth worries about anymore. And that is simply because acidifying substances are gradually, have gradually disappeared uh, from Europe. And it is just as much a public good as, or the reduction of these things is just as much a public good as greenhouse gas emission reduction. And the reason that this happens is essentially a coalition of forces. First, a big source of acidifying substances is cars in cities. And it just so happens that cars in cities don't just cause acid rain, but they also cause problems with urban air pollution. And it just so happens that if you solve your urban air pollution, then you also, by sheer coincidence, also reduce your acid rain acidifying emissions. And there's good reasons to solve urban air pollution because it makes people ill. And those are local solutions, local solutions to local problems that also happen to solve the continent. The second reason is that another big source of acidifying substances is power generation. But when this problem was acknowledged and when the solutions to these problems came into place, these power plants were still state-owned. By now a lot of this industry is privatized and therefore the shareholders of these companies would object to stringent uh, government policy. But when these deals were made, it was essentially one part of the government telling the other, another part of the government what to do. And there was much less protest. And they're called monopolies anyway, so they could just pass on the additional cost of cleaning up their acid rain problems to their customers. So that is another reason why this policy worked at the time. There was a very strong public demand this is mainly driven from Germany, where in the late 80s people thought that because of acid rain, all the trees in Europe would die. And the Germans called this Waldsterben, that's now a proper English word as well, with a different meaning. And Waldsterben means essentially the, die, the forest die, that it meant that uh, at the time. So there was a big concern, and sort of if you go to the German primeval mind, the forest is very important uh, because that is where we came from in you know, German. So there was a very strong public demand that we should be doing something about this. And at the same time, the technological fixes in cars and in power plants were not that expensive. So the electricity became 20, 25% more expensive because of acid rain uh, policy. So that is sort of doable. That's fixable. And it is a technical thing. It's not that you have to change your lifestyle, you can no longer go to on holiday in Thailand, things like that. No, your fuel becomes a bit more expensive, your car becomes a bit more expensive, and your electricity becomes a bit more expensive, but only a bit. 
So that conspired uh, to solve the problem. There was another thing going on actually related to the privatization of power generation in Europe, and that is that coal was being phased out. Not because of acid rain policy, but because coal, as a source of electricity, could no longer compete with gas. And gas burns a lot cleaner than coal does. So that was sort of a coincidence. Nothing to do with the policy, just happened. And there was another big coincidence, and that's a big coincidence. And that is that uh, the Berlin Wall fell, the Soviet Union came apart, and there was an economic crisis throughout Eastern Europe, and its heavy industry, a major source of emissions, completely and utterly collapsed. And that took with it a lot of the uh, emissions. Did we agree on providing this continental public goods called reduction of uh, acidifying emissions? No, not really. It just happened. And most of the action had little to do with this particular international treaty. So that is a, uh, acid rain. What about ozone? That's not a continental public policy. That's a global public, public policy. The acidifying substances, the sulfur and things that I talked about, sort of, they stay in the atmosphere for up to two weeks and they can travel a thousand, maybe two thousand kilometers, so that's a continental problem. The stuff that destroys our ozone layer comes from all across the world and it threatens essentially everybody. This is a true global public uh, good. So what happened uh, with ozone? The threat, uh, the, hole, the hole in the ozone layer was essentially discovered uh, in the early 80s, in the Vienna Conference in 1985, it was internationally recognized as a threat to global public health. And as a response to this threat, there was a solemn agreement that we should cooperate uh, and share information. But there was no agreement on actual emission reduction. That agreement came uh, in Montreal in 1988. And there are a few big differences between the way the UNFCCC was negotiated and the way the Montreal Protocol was negotiated. For climate, from the very start, North Weikerhout 88, Rio uh, 92, it was a UN treaty. Every godforsaken country on the planet was part of the deal. In Montreal, the starting point was 24 like-minded countries. It was a global problem, but they say we're not going to talk to St. Lucia, we're not going to talk to Ghana, we're going to talk to ourselves. Uh, and what happened over time was two things. One, the Montreal Protocol was negotiated in 1988, it was amended five times, and two things happened during each amendment. A, more parties ascended to the treaty, so it grew in scope, it also grew in ambition. Whereas the Montreal Protocol was sort of, yeah, we're going to do something about it. By the time that you're at the Fifth Amendment, since, since January 2001, you can no longer make CFCs, you can no longer sell CFCs, you can no longer buy CFCs, you can no longer own CFCs. What was CFCs? Chlorofluorocarbons. Oh, okay. stuff that, that's the stuff that you use in fridges and in uh, deodorant and all that sort of stuff that then sort of like flows heavily through the atmosphere until it sort of comes, hits 10 kilometers above your head, where it responds with the ultraviolet. The ultraviolet radiation from the sun and starts breaking down ozone in a catalytic process. The starting point was small, not ambitious, and it grew over time to large and ambitious, whereas climate negotiations started large and ambitious. And this was a huge success these things are now just completely forbidden and the hole in the ozone layer is closing again. It will take till the end of your lifetimes for it to be completely closed, so don't go out in the sun too much, but it is basically so. So why was this? First, there was a strong public demand. The hole in the ozone layer was associated with cancer and if you use the C word, people sit up. And at one point, the US EPA predicted that 100 million people would get skin cancer as a result of the hole in the ozone layer over the century. And of course, that was reported in the newspapers as 100 million people will die each year because of this problem. A bit of an exaggeration, but people said that. The second reason why this worked was that there were the substitutes. The HFCs, 
which are almost as good as refrigerants, etc., which are only slightly more expensive. So there was a cheap technological fix. Just like with acid rain, there was a cheap technological fix. A cheap technological fix is not on the horizon of climate. And some cynical people say that this is actually the reason there was the Montreal Protocol. So the cynical account of what happened in Montreal was as follows. So we have these two-week negotiations being announced later in the year in Montreal. Everybody's pessimistic. This is a global public good. We will never provide this. People traveled in a very pessimistic mode to Montreal, and the negotiations were there, and they were not going anywhere, and people were making polite noises about how serious the problem was, and we really should be doing something about it, but you go first, not me. You go first, not me. And then into the second week of the negotiations, and then on the Wednesday night, something happened. And what happened was that the CEO of DuPont called up the White House and said, look, Ron, we've solved the problem. We have developed an alternative to CFCs. Now you negotiate us a sweet deal in Montreal. So Ron, who's Ronald Reagan, called up his negotiators in Montreal and said, we have a breakthrough. So overnight, the US switched position from uh, you go first and yes, yeah, serious problem, we don't have to do much. Overnight, the US switched position and said, we want a strong deal. The Europeans and the Japanese were so flabbergasted by this that they just gave in and said, <laughs> if there's a solution, then we must have a solution too. And they just signed up to a deal. Essentially what the deal did was it said, you can no longer use CFCs. But of course, we want to keep refrigerate our food, right? Well, it spoils. We want to keep using foam. We want to keep you in making uh, semiconductors. But only Dupont knew how to supply and how to make this alternative. So essentially, what Montreal did was it handed a monopoly on HFCs to one particular company who happened to have a friend in the White House. That is the cynical interpretation of what happened in Montreal. And the Europeans and the Japanese were stupid enough to sign up to this. And Buzz F and companies like that were in deep trouble as a result because they lost the major market. They were a major supplier of CFCs. And all of a sudden, you could no longer sell the bloody stuff. And only DuPont knew how to sell the alternative. So that is what happens between those countries. And then other countries were essentially bribed into various ways. They were either given money or access to technology in the case of India or in the case of China the rules were very simple if China wants to become part of the World Trade Organization then it had to sign up to Montreal that was a precondition and those deals were individually stuck with a great uh, many countries. Why is the, the cynical point of view consider it stupid for the EU, the Europeans and Japanese to have followed through with that? Why would you give a monopoly to an American company? I suppose but it's well, I mean, and, I mean, it, it's good from an environmental perspective, from, but from the perspective of industrial policy, this was a pretty dumb deal. Buzz F and everybody caught up with yeah. DuPont, but DuPont had a big head start here and made a lot of money out of this, and Buzz F lost a lot of money in similar for, now I forget the names of the Japanese countries who lost out as a result. The enforcement mechanism under Montreal was that you could, if you were part of Montreal, you were allowed to trade in CFCs, but if you were not part of Montreal, then you could no longer buy CFCs from countries that were in Montreal. What are CFCs? CFCs are simple to make. They're sort of the stuff that anybody with a degree in chemical engineering would know how to make. But they're only cheap when you make them at scale. So if you're a small country, then you could never sort of meet your demand for CFCs by making these things domestically. So for small countries, really the question was, if I sign up to Montreal, then I can continue to buy CFCs for a while and I have immediate access to its alternatives. Whereas if I don't sign up to Montreal, I will be thrown out of the CSC market sooner, and I could never make these things domestically, so that doesn't make any sense. So you sign up to Montreal. 
for large countries this doesn't hold, and that is why the substantial bribes that I was talking about were given to uh, China and India. For large countries like the US, they essentially got a monopoly on the AIDS of SEPA uh, market, right? So that it was why they signed up. And then large countries like the EU and Japan were just not, did not keep their eye on the ball. So that is all given in these slides. Go ahead. Sorry, just, so the H HFCs are the, are the hydro they Yes. Okay. Yes. They don't destroy the ozone layer, but they do cause very significant climate problems. So what do we learn from this for climate? Yes, there are these two treaties out there, one providing a continental public good, one providing a global public good. Um, but do they really provide a model for international climate policy? The thing that they perhaps have in common is uh, that there's a strong public demand for a solution. Acid rain and ozone both have sort of a cheap technical fix to the problem. That is not on the cards for climate, uh, so that is a crucial difference. In the case of acid rain, emissions came down for other reasons than policy, and that is not on the cards for climate. For the CFCs, a crucial difference between the technological alternative that was on offer to solve the ozone problem that we don't see in climate is that the companies or the countries that supplied the problem, the CFCs, also supply the solution, HFCs. Whereas what we sort of see people do with reducing greenhouse gas emissions is say, we don't want to buy Saudi oil, we don't want to buy Nigerian oil, we don't want to buy Qatari gas, we don't want to buy Russian gas. We want domestic wind and domestic solar. So the ones who provide the problem, fossil fuels, are not the same as the ones who provide the solution, renewables. And therefore there's immediate opposition there. Whereas it was easy for DuPont to convince DuPont to switch from a low margin bulk product to a high margin bulk product. That's a good thing, right? But there is no solution here to keep the Saudis and the Russians happy. The alternative would be that we abandon Saudi oil and we start buying Saudi solar instead. So you want their own solar. Right? We don't want that Saudi solar in the wrong way. So there, there's structural systematic differences between the problems of acidification and the hole in the ozone layer to climates and the structural and systematic difference to, to the solution. And therefore, these success stories of international negotiations on environmental agreements do not carry over to climate. Jeff? Would, there be, would it be the case, though, you think that if there was some sort of extreme technological change that was able to trump sort of the Saudis' control over our life, for example, say we plunge a fusion suddenly become a thing overnight? If yes. <laughs> or if fusion would become a thing overnight, the climate problem would be gone in a minute. Or if I don't know, if, would it be possible if strong public demand that there says there was some mad hysteria that we were all going to die in 10 years or something? <laughs> like, like the one you read about every week in the newspaper, in uh, the Guardian, right? Yeah, but everyone yeah. Guardian, right? <laughs> Yes, if, 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 but those conditions are not met. There is no simple solution to reducing your greenhouse gases. And yes, there is a public demand, but once you confront the public demand and say, but now your electricity bill will double, that demand very quickly crumbles. People are prepared to pay 10% more or 20% more for electricity to help reduce climate change, but not much more than that. And there's no solutions in that price range. 